and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 46, Origin Stories. From Hamilton, Ontario, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We start here live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop and continue on even after the double bell ends the show for the more off-the-books after show. For those of you who aren't here live, you can listen in on this audio as well as audio from our pre-show banter, our front desk, by macking our Patreon. As a thanks for supporting us, you also get other cool stuff like access to a private Discord channel where you can chat with us and other fans of the show, pre-production show notes, behind-the-scenes blog posts, and more. Uh, this week is another special episode. It's a con wrap-up episode, and I got oh, these aren't always for everyone. If this isn't your jam, we get it. Feel free to skip this one and tune in next week when we get back to answering your game and game night questions. So tonight what I'm going to be doing is talking all about my experiences at the Origins Game Fair 2019, one of the largest tabletop gaming conventions in North America. Origins is a huge event and I've got a ton of games I want to talk about. Due to this, we are deviating from our usual podcast format. Instead of our usual segments, today's show is going to be all about Origins 2019. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Now, normally, we'd like to take some time during this show each week to read off some comments on our content or feedback we've received. This is something we'll be returning to next week. We get better with your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Uh, you can also hit us up on social media, where we can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, what I do want to do here in this segment is thank everyone, and there's a lot of you. Everyone is a ton of people that I interacted with at Origins. It was awesome to be walking the halls of the con and have people actually like run up, jog up, and be like, hi, I love the show. That was, was so gratifying. Um, I got a lot of positive feedback through the con, and I left with a very strong sense of creative validation. Um, there really are people out there who really dig what we do, what we're doing here. Here, and that is awesome and it was so good to hear it you know it's always fantastic uh to hear from anyone from uh, who listens to the show good or bad we really do mean that uh we get better uh through whatever you tell us so feel free to reach out uh or leave a comment somewhere uh, on one of our social medias or anywhere you can find us and let us know so there was one bit of negative feedback I heard more than once while I was at the convention. It's that our listeners are sick of hearing about Bloomhaven. So that's something we'll be changing in the future. It's simple enough, a quick fix. You'll still be able to find our Gloomhaven content for those of you who dig it. Uh, but we won't be talking about it here on the show as a regular segment going forward. And I do have to say, as Sean just said, we don't mind that kind of feedback. It's that kind of thing we need to hear. We're doing thing this to make your game night better. And if there's something you think we should change, please let us know and we'll definitely consider it. Absolutely. We've made many changes to the format of the show already, and we're not against making some more. We record the show live Wednesday nights at 930 Eastern on Twitch, and we encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room, The Lobby. Don't forget, if you were here live, we continue the show after the double bell in an off-the-books after show, as well as some special features that might make it onto YouTube. Tonight, we've got a crowded chat room for us. We've got Angel of Flight, another TTVT viewer, Cycle Motion, Freddy Bot, Happy Fun Time Live, Major Kayla, Prayerborn, Shadzar, Slow Cool, Teldurn, Popped In and Out, Trasharama, VNK, Burgo Pros, and Wilt Chamberlain. Oh, awesome. There's some names there I recognize. It's cool Absolutely. to see some locals in here. People are curious about our, uh, our origins. Maybe I'm wrong about people not liking the... Um, Every uh, blah, blah, pie, blah, the thing with the con, con recap episodes. Recap. Wow. Yeah. 
Okay, con crud. I blame it on <laughs> I, I blame it on the con crud. So seeing as all we're actually talking about tonight is origins, uh, normally what I like to do in this segment is give the chat room something to talk about. Uh, well, tonight's origins. And if you didn't go, that's going to be a little hard to talk about. If you did go, I would love to hear how it went for you. But what I'm thinking is I'm going to be talking about a ton of games. And these aren't all new. So I, as we've mentioned many times in the show, we're not always about the new hotness. Though tonight we're probably going to be as close to the new hotness as we get. But some of the best things I saw this weekend were not new games. And there's a good chance you all have played some of these. So I would love to hear your thoughts on some of these games that I'm excited about. All right. We'll be back checking in with the chat room throughout the show. Normally, we are here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Well, the best way is for questions to come through the website so they don't get lost. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. As we've already mentioned, tonight we're taking a short break from answering your questions to recap Mo's trip to Columbus, Ohio for the Origins Game Fair. Now, I've talked about Origins quite a bit in the past, uh, specifically our last episode, Pros at Cons, where we talked about... Uh, way to prep before going to a game convention. And then there was also a gaming convention preparations tip blog post written over on the blog. So I don't want to go through all of my history with Origins because I've done that already on the show and on the blog. But I will just give you a short bit just in case you're tuning in for the first time. So Deanna and I attended Origins for the first time in 2014 and absolutely loved it. Uh, this was our first big con experience. And man, I, I've never felt so comfortable and at home in a crowd of so many people. It was awesome that everyone there had something in common with me. Now, we managed to make it back in 2016 and had an even better experience, uh, mostly due to just getting used to it and it not being our first con experience and knowing where to find things and learning some of those tips and tricks we talked about. Now, 2017 was the year we paid to go, but couldn't go due to health issues with my parents. So unfortunately, that wasn't the best year for us. Now, 2018, though, had us back in Columbus, and I got to say that was like the magical trip. That was the the what solidified to me Origins as one of my favorite gaming conventions. And it was there that we met all our friends from Buffalo, the Gem crew and um, people who came in from out of town. Uh, we met a ton of people. It's there that we made all of our con friends. Now, this year was a little different because this was our first time attending as press. And that meant a big change in focus for us this year. This year, we weren't just there as gamers, but also there to work. And while I couldn't make it this year, it already looks like I'm trying to see if we can't make it work next year. So we'll have the full Bellhop team available uh, and possibly even start doing interviews live from uh, Origins. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I'm looking forward to that. More more photography, too, after, because, you know, me with my uh, my phone works fairly well for, you know, Twitter and Instagram. It's not the best photography. So, <clears throat> so I mentioned that we went as press, and I'm thinking it's worth mentioning because I doubt a lot of people know exactly what that means. So what press meant uh, was I got to go to the con for free. But that means this, this piece of paper was covered, my badge, and that's it. There was nothing else covered. If I wanted to play a game, attend a panel, play Artemis, or sign up for a tournament, I had to pay for all that, which actually kind of surprised me because personally, I would think they would want press reporting on these like actual events. And then things like the hotel, travel costs, food, that all came out of our pocket. And holy cow, Origins is not cheap to attend. Now, the other thing it lets us do is it meant that I'd be recognized as press. So what press meant is that I was vetted. So someone at the Origins people took my info, looked at it, and went, yep, he's good enough to be there, right? So this, I was hoping, would mean that companies, when I approached them, were like, oh, you're press. You're not just every other gamer, which was pretty cool. Um, and I do think it did make a big difference for people who didn't recognize me from Twitter, Facebook, or old G+. Now, the other thing it let me do was um, get into the hall early 
on one day. And I did have access to a press room if we were doing audio or video recordings, but we weren't. So I didn't even touch that aspect. So that was pretty cool. But because of this, uh, the majority of my con was spent meeting with representatives of company. Now, while I did do some gaming, overall, I was there to work. It's a very different experience when, you, when you've got that, that press badge on because uh, people want to take your time. And I know we talked about several times before uh, in the weeks leading up to the con where the email was getting packed with mm -hmm. requests and information from companies because, again, you, they know you're there to work. Uh, they want you there to work. So they're trying to fill your schedule with their content. Yeah, to be honest, pretty much everyone wanted to schedule me every half hour. Like that was like, and I could tell it was the same thing for the companies that were there. Like the, leading up to to Origins, I got a ridiculous number of emails and most of them were, we want to meet with you. Here's a link to my schedule, just book time. So, and that was it. Like I, it was my response to pick a time and then be there at that time. And like, I, if, if I had wanted to, I could have booked my entire origins every half hour doing something now that's not something i did uh, we talked about this last episode i like to schedule a limited number of things per day to leave open time and i did manage to do that every day except sunday sunday was working day from the, the hall closes at 4 p.m on sunday so until 4 p.m i was tied up so that is some background on origins right we, i've been a lot i'm no expert but i have been what five times now um, a little change this year. Now, I didn't know while I was there to work, that doesn't mean I didn't have some fun too. So while there, I managed to fit in quite a few demo games, a few full games, and some off-the-book gaming with friends. So what I want to talk about here, and I think this is going to be the thing that's going to interest the most people, is the games that I actually got to play. And then after that, I'm going to talk about some other games I'm excited about, but that I didn't actually get to sit at a table and physically touch. Now, remember, when you're going and playing g demo games specifically, you don't always get the full mm -hmm. game experience. Uh, there are any number of ways that the companies are trying to sort of rush people through, whether mm -hmm. they're unfortunately, and God forbid you ever, they ever, any company ever do this, throwing the game and oh, letting you that. win, or just giving you a short portion of the game to try and give you the taste, but not having you sit down for a three hour you know, gaming blitz when they could be bringing more people through. So not all these games necessarily were able to be played the full time because of demo uh, situations. Yeah, that's a very good point. Also note that like all of these I played like once, right? There, there is one exception. So I didn't get the deep dive. I have no idea if any of these games reward repeated plays or reward system mastery. Uh, these are basically a bunch of first impressions. So one of the cool things I got to do um, because of the press badge is go to a special event from Queen Games on Wednesday night. Uh, this was cool because they literally contacted press and said, which of our games do you want to play? And had every single one of the games people mentioned on that list out on a table with a teacher for each game standing waiting for you when you walked in. That was amazing. Now, what I didn't know, and I've learned from Travis from Queen Games, huge thumbs up to Travis, got along with him really well this, this trip, uh, was that this is the first year they've done that every previous year they've done what everyone else did which is half hour to 15 minute segments meeting with press over the weekend teaching the same game over and over and over again they loved it so much the feedback was so good that they're going to do it again next year and we're going to i'm hoping other people do it though travis is like Shh, don't tell other people to do it but i i wish every company did this because this was a great way to do it plus it was a bit of a party right we were all press we were all there i got to see some of the biggest names in podcasting at this event like no there wasn't food and drinks but we were all there to play queen games which was really cool so at that event i played two games and the first was merlin now this is not new hotness what was new hotness was an expansion for it so they had merlin out and this is uh first came out 2017 and it's a Steffenfeld. And anyone who listens to the show knows I am a huge fan of Steffenfeld. If you like rondelles, uh, if you don't know what that is, check out our mechanics episode. You will love Merlin. It is a rondelle around a rondelle around a rondelle with all of those rondelles being the round table, right, Merlin? Very cool. This is literally three nested rondelles. Uh, uses roll and move of all things, but done well because you roll your dice. And you have three dice in your color. You have a white die and a black die. The white die moves Merlin. The black die moves 
Arthur and the three dice in your color move your knight of the round table. And that just determines which way you go on the rondels. So your actual characters go clockwise, but Merlin and Arthur are important, so it can go both ways. Basically, that's it. You roll the dice, you move your guys, and you get stuff. Uh, as I noted, it's a step and fell, it's a point salad. Uh, every spot has you doing something. When you do the thing, you get some points. There are so many things. I'm not going to get into it. Just you, there's area control. There's co set collection. There's even like a map where you're building forts. All kinds of different things you get points for. So with Merlin, we got to try the Arthur expansion. Uh, I will admit, I'm a little clouded as to what was part of the expansion, what wasn't. Um, there was some new options. There were new ways to score points. The biggest thing that stuck out as being new is that you fought against the Picts, which added a um, whoever has the most mechanic and whoever has the least mechanic. So whoever fought the most Picts got three points and whoever fought the least lost three points. Uh, overall, I love this. This was one of the best games I played all weekend. I kind of knew it. I love Steffenfeld. I actually really like Rondell's. This is a very solid game. This is literally the top of my wish list right now. If I had a budget left after Origins and was going shopping for games, I would be bringing home Merlin. They were sold out by the end of the con, so there was no chance of me bringing that home either way. Now, so Merlin, the Arthur expansion, is their latest expansion that's been released, but there is actually one more that's going to be coming out this year, I assume, at one of the later shows. There is another, there is a 2019 uh, okay. expansion that, that is uh, listed, but not actually released yet. So there is, <clears throat> there is even more new hotness coming to this. This is just the newest one that is released already. Yeah, they were excited about Arthur. Like they were really that that was their big push, right? It wasn't to show off Merlin, but but to show off um Arthur. Now the game that most people were excited about, like I I I signed up to play Merlin, right? I told you they they had me list which games I wanted to play, and I'm like, I want to play Merlin. So I got to play Merlin, and that was a full game, which is worth noting. Uh everyone else at that booth was drooling over this game, Copenhagen. Uh, this is a polyomino based abstract strategy game where you're building an apartment building because I guess there's a very distinct look of these bright colored apartment buildings in Copenhagen with these square windows. Uh, really simply, each round you're going to take cards, very ticket to ride like, um, where you can take two cards next to each other and you're just colors. Like there's four different colors, you take two cards. Then you're going to trade in a set of those cards and you're going to get to take a polyomino with that many squares in it. So if you trade in three cards, you get like an L-shaped three thing. If you trade in four, you could get a cross or whatever, right? Think Tetris tiles. Then you're going to put them into your building. And what you're trying to do is every row completed is worth one point. Every column is worth two points. And if either of those is completely filled with windows, you double the points. Except for that, there's some symbols on the board and if you cover those you get special bonus tiles that break the rules that's pretty much it it is up there with games like azul and sagrada for those really quick to teach three minute teach people love it games but personally i found it a little too light like it seems great for families and that but like i already own azul and i love azul and i already own sagrada and i'm gonna get a copy of planet someday copenhagen just kind of fits with all those games and i didn't feel i needed another one now, there are a lot of people who went nuts over this game, including people in our personal gaming group. The uh, misdirected Mark Gem people went nuts for this game. Uh, I mentioned it to Chris Nizak. He went and bought a copy. We played it multiple times, his copy multiple times over the con. They, they loved it. Uh, even on their podcast last night, they were raving about this game. So I'm on the outside on this one, thinking it's a little too simple. People are going nuts for it. It is... It's one of those quick to teach, hard to learn games, or, or difficult to master games, which is a sweet spot for people. Now, Trasharama mentioned this in the uh, chat room, and I was actually about to mention it also. They are putting out, not only do they have the game board game, but they are putting out a roll and write version, mm -hmm. where rather than drafting, it's the dice that pick the, uh, the colors that you're working with. So uh, they're really doubling down on this Copenhagen thing, because they've also yeah. already got an expansion out mm -hmm. uh, for the original all in the same year. So they've got yeah. three portions of this game all showing, uh, hitting the market in one year. There's actually a fourth. They also put out a deluxe edition where all the tiles are yes. acrylic. And then they have a queenie, which this is something I, I knew they existed, but queenies are a big thing. And what they are is small expansion packs for games. But they're like high end, like 
Uh, over the years for Extra Life, we sold many of the Mayfair ones, where it's like one or two new tiles for a game, and that's it. The Queenies are like replacement parts. And there's a Queenie for Copenhagen to get all the acrylic tiles. And there's other ones like that. So the other thing worth noting is I actually won a game while at that event. I won a copy of Chicago Express with the expansion and all the Queenies for it. So that was pretty cool. Uh, that's something I already owned, Chicago Express. I dig it. It's an 18xx game you can play in about half an hour which is really neat. And the expansion is out of print and hard to find. So I was really excited to get the expansion. So for those of you in Windsor, you'll expect to see my old copy of Chicago Express, or the sealed new copy of Chicago Express to be in our Extra Life auction this year. And I'll be keeping that expansion, though. All right. All right, this next one I think Sean's going to be curious about, and it is New Frontiers from Rio Grande Games. Uh, this is the new Race for the Galaxy board game. Now, anyone who's been following me, even for a short amount of time, knows I love Race for the Galaxy. And due to that love, this was like the one game that I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm going to Origins. I got to try New Frontiers before I go home. We purposely went the first night, Wednesday night, to get this played. Um, I'm sad to say I was disappointed. This is a board game version of Race for the Galaxy. Uh, the tiles, the planets are named the same. Like, if you know what Contract Specialist does, it does the same thing. Uh, it's still action selection, but instead of you all picking an action blind, it goes in a turn order. So, And you can't pick what the other people picked. So that's, that's a simplified version. That's a change. Um, there's a couple of new phases because now you have money. So Because you don't have cards, so you have to have money as a resource. Uh, everything's open information, which I kind of like that because the development cards instead are tiles and every development card in the game is out there on a board. So you can just look at them and pick what you want. It's just the planets that are pulled from a bag when you use the explore action. Uh, overall, there's, there's other changes, but overall what it meant is a simpler, much easier to teach game, but it just didn't seem to have the depth of the original. Now, even the guy who did the demo for us is like, this is the game that I use to introduce people to the Race for the Galaxy universe. So when I meet a new gamer and they haven't played, I play this with them. And then we move on and play Race for the Galaxy or Roll for the Galaxy. Which, okay, cool. They have this to teach them the real game. But for buying this for me just seems like a step backwards. And Sean's finally figured out Race for the Galaxy. Maybe if Sean couldn't figure out Race for the Galaxy, I would have bought New Frontiers. But I just point in this game yeah no i'm i'm looking at it uh, now and and it's you know i'm seeing a lot of sort of similarities to the role for the galaxy as, as well it's 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 feeling more similar to the role for the galaxy mm -hmm. to me uh even than race for the galaxy uh and yeah i can definitely see how this would sort of be the the intro game for yeah i, I mean i could see how it would be something that you might want for game night to run but yeah. really that's something the store should probably buy not you <laughs> but even yeah. then you're gonna buy like it's not cheap right like yeah. if it was cheap and a quick intro to get someone else to buy a race like this shouldn't be your entry point like maybe they're trying to get your their next ticket to ride they want it to be a gateway game but it, to me it seemed overly complicated to do that and as prayerborn in the chat is saying they already tried to do this with jump drive which is again supposed to be a simple race for the guy and man i wanted to try that one too we just didn't fit it in here is a new hotness. All right. So up next here, here's our, okay, we're good. Like go again. I should have brought the thing up. I found it the other day. <clears throat> you know, the drink of coffee here. And all right, here's super new hotness. This is so new that the game funded on Kickstarter a week ago. Uh, this is from game designer Connor Magui, uh, whose company is Inside Up Games. They are extremely well known for a game called Summit, which, man, I wanted to demo it, but Summit's hot because it won like the Dice Tower Game of the Year or some kind of award from the Dice Tower. And the only demos they were doing were paid demos and you had to pre-schedule and they were all full. So I didn't get to try that. But I had a meeting with Connor and I said, well, I don't want to see Summit. Everyone's heard of Summit. What's the next thing from uh or inside up games and he's like oh seven souls so he sat me down to play this game and what i liked the best was the theme because in it you are cthulhu cultists working in three different locations and they were the typical victorian manor kind of places in a library and i think the other was a school to try to complete rituals build altars and corrupt the good guy investigators who are coming to find you I thought that was really neat because I hadn't seen that 
flip on the Cthulhu theme. And I'm not a Cthulhu fan. So it was cool to see it the other way around. Um, all of this is driven by card-based axiom selection. You're going to have seven cards, numbered one to seven. Each does something different. The seven cards more powerful than one card, but you play them blindly on the three different actions. So of your seven cards, three are going to be tied up. You then reveal them and you do them in an initiative order starting for one. So if you got the one card, you're going to go first, but it doesn't do much. If you play the same number, you have to battle, which is kind of neat. Um, then after you do it, resolve the cards. Um, the types of things you do are improving your deck, which I'll get to in a second, getting these focus tokens, which are used to build the altars, but they're also used to modify your deck and get victory point tokens, which were called something gold or icons or something Cthulhu S mythos tokens, whatever. They were zero to three points. They're blind. So you didn't know what you got until you grabbed them. Uh, uh the other callings. thing you do is those are callings. Hmm? Callings. There you go. I couldn't remember the name. I knew it was some Cthulhu tied in thing. So you can collect callings. The other thing you do is add fear to the other cultist deck, which are bad cards. So getting to the deck, this is the interesting part is you start with a deck with one success in it and it counts as one. It has like a swirly eyeball thing and four fear cards. So you have a one in five chance of succeeding at the beginning of the game. Every time you get a new card for your deck, it's always positive, And it's one or two of these swirly symbols. You never get the negative ones unless people put fear in your deck. So it's not like deck building where you're trying to get unique cards. All it's building is a success or failure combat deck, which I thought was really neat. Uh, there's some cool stuff here. Like they, there was some interesting stuff going on. Uh, when you battled investigators, you flip one card from your deck. And if you had more success than your opponent, you won and you could spend those focus tokens, um, to corrupt investigators. They had things they would say four out of five, which is you're going to flip five cards off your deck and you need four successes. And again, your focus tokens would modify that. Uh, it was neat. There was some interesting, I really liked the build your own combat deck system, especially trying to remember how many fear cards other people had because anytime you used a card it was removed from the game so trying there the thing is it just it wasn't fulfilling it was way too short it was almost a filler game like uh, most games seem to last about 45 minutes and overall it's neat it does some neat things but it just didn't have enough meat nor was it simple enough to be like a Copenhagen where you can teach it in three minutes, right? Like it just, it it was in between a filler and a medium Euro and just didn't really reach either. Yeah, they've got it listed as a 30 to 40 minute uh, playtime. Yeah. Uh, I have to say it's really quite an interesting, it was actually originally titled Rise of the yeah. Elder Gods. Uh, and I can understand perhaps why they might have uh, dropped that title. <clears throat> but a uh, great quote from their uh, description controlling these weak human parasites in an effort to gather support, power, and souls to feed their hunger and desires. <laughs> uh, so if you are a, a Cthulhu fan, uh, I can see how this would be a, you know, a quick, quick game. It's two to six players. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, the fact that it plays six players is a nice, uh, mm -hmm. a nice feature and apparently still only takes uh, 40 minutes. Yeah, it was, it's, if you dig, Take that games, you might like this. There was an awful lot of player versus player interaction in this game. Like I would definitely rate it above, say, a Munchkin for that style of game. But I don't know, wasn't for me. Maybe I should have tried Summit. Well, and you're not a big Cthulhu fan, so I can definitely see. Uh, there's a uh, the art on it is actually really nice yes. and stylistically. It reminds me of the Steam game that I was just talking to you about the other day, uh, Dark Dungeons, mm -hmm. uh, which is again a very Cthulhuistic game. Um, and it looks like it's a Welsh artist based on that name because no one but the Welsh would name their <laughs> child that. Uh. <sighs> All right. Just to prove that I don't hate lighter games, uh, our next one is Monster Match. The folks at No Star Games uh, are the masters of the loud, eye-catching party games. They're the people who brought us Happy Salmon and Funky Chicken. Um, Monster Match is the newest of these style of games and the best, in my opinion, of those games. Uh, the rules are really simple. You have 10 cards are put out on the table, a set of dice are rolled, and players have to point at a card that matches what shows on the dice. Now, one die says 0 to 5, and the other die either says arms, legs, or eyes. And the pitchers are all monsters with zero to one legs, arms, and eyes. Uh, there's also a tile in the bit middle that says zilch or zero. And if none of those are up, you touch that. When you get a card, you touched it. 
it's worth a number of donuts, one to three. Uh, when you hit the zilch card, nine new monsters come out. Whoever collected the most points at the end of the game wins. That's it. It's that simple. Uh, everyone should know that I'm not a big party game fan, but I really like this. We had a ton of fun playing this at base camp. Uh, it's extremely simple. So cute. Like the pouch it comes in is like you unzip the monster's mouth to get the cards out. Uh, if you want games to play with your kids, with friends, family, uh, over drinks, you're going to like this game. Like this is, it's just silly, stupid fun. Really dig monster match from North star games. And be aware that there is another Monster Match game titled Monster Match from 2002, which is a very different game. Don't get confused. <laughs> According to Northstar, that is so out of print, no one will find it. So that's okay. why they felt comfortable. Which is interesting because it's name. only, I mean, it's only 2002, but uh, uh, it's actually a Ravensburger. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, they probably Ravensburg is around, so I'm sure they did talk to him. Yeah. But seriously, I, I don't do the light yelly party games. This was fun. All right. Another one. This is one of the big games of Origins. Everyone was going nuts for this. This was possibly the hottest game. Uh, it's from White Wizard Games, who were a uh, premier sponsor this year. They're right on the lanyard this year. That's the company that made uh, Star Realms, uh, Hero Realms, Epic, and a bunch of other card games. Uh, this is yet another card-based dueling game, which makes sense because this company was funded by people who won Magic Pro tournaments and decided they could make better games. So it totally makes sense. Uh, it's obviously inspired by Magic, but there are some key differences in Sorcerer that I found really made it unique. So the first thing is they took the concept of Smash Up and put that into this. And Smash Up is a game where you pick two different decks, you mash them together and you play with them. Well, that's what you do in this. You are going to pick a character out of four characters. You're going to pick a lineage out of four lineages. And you're going to pick a domain out of four domains. You're going to take the top card of each of those decks because they give you special abilities. And you're going to shuffle the rest of the decks together to form your play deck. Um, you're going to use energy to cast spells. This was neat because instead of a mana, like it's your mana system, right? Uh, there's only one type, but there was a cool rule where the player whose turn it is decides either both players get four mana or you roll a die, D6, no, it's a D8, to determine how much you get. So I thought that was an interesting choice. Um... The other thing that was well done was you're fighting three battle zones. So you're not actually attacking the other player. Uh, so you're fighting over three zones. It's a Victorian England kind of looking thing, but they were very insistent, not steampunk. Definitely, definitely not steampunk. So Victorian, but not steampunk area. Uh, and you're fighting for control of these three areas. And whoever controls two out of three areas wins the game. Uh, the rest of that's very magic. It's you're summoning minions, which go to each zone. Uh, in this game, you actually have a standee that represents your character. And you can only cast spells in the spots you're standing in. But you don't actually directly interact with the other sorcerers. So all that matters is if you're in the same zone or not. Your minions can be summoned anywhere. Combat system was dice-based, which was weird to see because you don't usually see that in these games. So if your attack power is four and the opponent's defense is five, you're rolling four attack dice and you're looking for numbers of hits. The dice were blanks, one hit and two hits. So kind of hero questy in a way there. Um, it was cool. Uh the three and four player rules actually sounded good. So it didn't sound like they designed a two player game and went, well, we might get people wanting to play three or four players. In particular, the three player game sounded fantastic where you have one zone between the players to your left and right, which sounded really neat. Uh, overall, um, this looks good. You're going to be hearing more about this one. I'll admit it straight up. White Wizard was awesome enough to hand me a review copy. That was one of my validations. They had one put aside for me because they recognized my name. So that was awesome. So you're going to you get to look forward to hearing more about Sorcerer in the coming weeks. That's one I want to get to the table soon. So uh, going by what they've got up on BGG so far, it is listed by the community as best at two yeah. with worst at four. Uh, huh. Like a very, okay. very deliberately, they have voted worst as four. Uh, 30 to 90 minute game. The one thing that strikes me most about this game when I'm looking at the art is they were very inspired by Gloomhaven, I feel like. Like the cover of the box feels like a differently colored Gloomhaven box cover. Mm. Uh, it really, really kind of feels that way. And I don't think that it was an intent. I, I think it's more of a sort of an homage more than anything. I don't think they were mm -hmm. deliberately trying to rip it off, but just the, the, the very, the feeling of that art feels like the Gloomhaven box cover. 
<laughs> I didn't notice that myself. Yeah, but you mentioning the art did remind me, this is not a game for kids. You are not happy, good sorcerers, you know, wizards battles. Uh, the character I was playing was a mass murderer with hacksaws who summoned demons. Uh, and the art is, it's definitely 14 plus at least. There, This is a very dark themed game. Uh, part of the teach, they didn't really tell me the background, but just like I was something like Mordecai the butcher who summons demons. Like it wasn't, it's not a happy fun game. Now, to twist things around and talk about happy, fun games, uh, that was an unintentional segue. I'm, I'm amused by that. And, of course, I did the podcast thing where you call out the segue, so it's no longer a good segue. Had to happen sometime on our show. Uh, the next game up is, oh, I should have said that Sorcerer. Remind me of that. I got to mention the name of the game at the start and the end. I'm terrible at it. I get mad when other podcasts don't do it. Hold me accountable. All right. Catch the Moon. Uh, this is an extremely cute dexterity game where you are trying to build a ladder to touch the moon. Uh, it's based on a kid's book, from what I understand, not one I remember growing up with. Uh, this There's a lot of buzz on this game. It's not new. I think it came out last year, maybe the year before. Uh, but a bunch of podcasters were going nuts on this one, going about how great it is. While I was there, I made sure to check out a copy and actually play it. And I got to say, everything I heard is justified this game is fantastic you have a plastic base that you're going to stick wooden ladders in now these ladders are kind of um tim burton looking i think is probably the best way to word it they're kind of zigzaggy they're not straight um they're very loose like they're the same stuff that your box inserts are made of the balsa wood almost very light and thin you roll a die to show if you need to be touching one ladder when you put your ladder on touching two or more ladders or if your ladder has to be the highest on the structure if any ladders fall it makes the moon sad and it cries and you take a crying moon token you keep doing this until all of the moon token, all the crying tokens are gone. And then whoever has the least crying to or sorry, the most crying, to sorry, the least crying tokens when they're all gone wins the game. What I really liked about this is this reminded me of hamster roll, which you all know I love in that choosing what piece to place was key and where to place it. There was actual strategy here. Like I'm going to place this here to try to sabotage the next player, or I'm going to try to build this in a really precarious place. It was neat. Very cute theme, amazing components. I dig it. This, this is a, a thumbs up dexterity game for me. Uh, interesting. So it's a 2017 game. Uh, I'm not sure if it's based off a book, but it may actually be based off of a Lisa Loeb children's album uh, okay. back in 2003 that I'm seeing I'm, I'm seeing references to. Uh, but I, so I'm not quite clear if it's if it's book or uh, book or off the album. I'm not seeing any actual book mentions. But uh, let okay. if, he, if if anyone knows anything, let us know. I'd be happy to uh, correct myself. So Very, I try. Yeah, trash. Yeah, I was just about to say trash. Rama is saying all the in ladders are individually cut wow. with no two ladders the same shape. Um, very cool. Yeah, very, very impressive game. Very hamster rollish. <laughs> yeah, in a way, like, like I said, each, that uniqueness. Yeah. The uniqueness. Uh, sticking with family, kids, kids' weight games, uh, I had a really good meeting with Haba. So I'm going to talk about a few Haba games here because they had stuff they wanted to show off. Uh, Haba's big thing this year is they want to prove their games are not just for kids. And I got to say, if you saw my pictures from Origins, I think I did a pretty good job <laughs> proving their games aren't just for kids. And I felt that all along. I've, I've had just as much fun playing Animal Upon Animal with adults as I have with kids. Uh, but I had some other games they wanted to show off and stuff I liked. Uh, uh, so one of the first is Dragon's Breath. Now, this is a unique game because it looks like it's a dexterity game. And this was at Origins last year when I was there and I walked right by it because I just thought it was a kid's dexterity game. But it's not actually a dexterity game at all. Like it's dexterity game the way the climbers is a dexterity game because you do have to physically move pieces, but it's there's no dexterity element. You can fix the pile. So what you have is a bunch of blue rings that are see-through and it's supposed to represent a bunch of gems trapped in ice and you're a bunch of baby dragons that want the eggs and mama dragon's going to help by melting the ice and the way that happens is you have these rings and inside are piled those little gems that you can get everywhere at michael's or whatever the magic health counters whatever you want to call them little spiky gems that are now in every board game imaginable as counters for things each round, you're going to look at it, and the players are going to bet on which color are going to fall out of this pile of rings. 
So then the player who's the mama takes off the top ring, gems fall. The gems that are the color you bet, you get to put in your own personal layer. Mama also picks a color, and it's every color the players haven't picked, and she puts those in her layer. And then there's also two holes, two or three holes on the board that fall direct to Mama's layer because Mama is a big bad dragon and can take more gems than the rest of you. And that's pretty much it. And then you bet and bet and bet until all the rings are removed. And then in a very well-designed box, you remove the top, and you get to see the various five dragon layers, and you count up whoever has the most gems. Uh, this is neat. Uh, it's, I totally had no clue this was a betting game. I think it's neat to see a betting game for kids because you don't usually see those two themes together. Um, the theme is awesome. The, the melting the ice is just cute. Uh, the gems, supposedly the babies are eating them. This won the 2018 Kinderspiel de Jar. And having now played it, I get it. I see why this won. Yeah, no, it's adorable. Uh, the art on it reminds me a lot of um, Spike from uh, yes. My Little Ponies. That's very much the sort of the, the, the concept of dragon you're getting. It's, it's not, mm -hmm. you know, aggressive dragons. Uh, uh, it's listed as four and up. So, you know, yeah. any, any age from pretty much as, as soon as they're, they're able to get their hands anywhere near those little spiky bits, go ahead and play them with it. So, uh, yeah, I think all you'd be worried about is the kid swallowing. Yeah, yeah. The, once, the once they're past, once they're past the swallowing stage, go for it. And that was uh, Dragon's Breath. Uh, Deanna points out we would have brought a copy of this home, but this is one of many games that sold out at Origins. There was not a copy to be had on Sunday. Actually, it wasn't even Sunday, was it? I think it was the day before I tried to get this on Saturday and they were sold out. Very cute game. Uh, not sure on adults with this one. Like, the betting's neat. You probably want something a little heavier for that. But a yellow does have a yellow line of games that are specifically for kids, and that's where this comes from. Now, my next game, though, is part of their other line, which I apologize apologize Habba for getting what you call it but it's your not yellow line it's your their euro game line uh this is a game called king of the dice and the best way i can describe this game though they didn't like it when i mentioned this at the press thing is this is roll for it but good because roll for it is a dice game where you're rolling dice and you're putting them on cards, trying to match the pattern on the card to take the cards that are worth points. And my kids love this game. My mother-in-law loves this game. I personally find it boring as hell. King of the Dice takes that basic mechanic and made it interesting. So what you're doing now is the dice are not just numbered one through six. They're also color coded. So you're looking for either sets of colors or sets of numbers or full houses or all odds or all evens or all different colors like there's a little bit more variety there because of the colors being the dice being colored as well as being numbered what you're doing is you are matching them to cards but these cards have a theme it's a fantasy world some generic you know could be D, &D could be whatever cute looking fantasy where you're collecting elves dwarves and knights and medieval looking people what this game also adds though are um in addition to the citizens, you also have districts that go above the citizens and you make a row of them. And there's an added rule that if the color of the citizen matches the district you're under and you match that citizen, you get the district too, and it's worth bonus points. So for adults, that's not a lot of added strategy, but for kids, this now has a strategy of, I might want to wait to take that card till next turn. Because what happens is when a citizen goes away, everyone shifts down. So there's some planning there. So it's one of those, well, I could take this person now, but if I wait till next turn, I'll get more points. I dug that. The other thing it does is a bunch of the citizens brought in new rules. So they had things like, if you get this person, you also get the person to their left. Or if you get this person, they're worth, like elves, were worth uh, exponential points. So if you had one worth, it's worth one. But if you had two elves, it was actually two to the power of two. And if you had three elves, it's three to the power of three. And if you had four elves, which there you're throwing some rather complex math for what's generally a kid's game. So again, this is their next step game. So this is for your teenagers, your your later, your later grade school, and while well, adults. I got to say, I dig it. I was not a fan of the base mechanics of this game because I basically owned that game and didn't like it. I really liked it in King of the Dice. This is one we brought home. Now, interestingly, uh, the community is rating this down from the box. The box is an 8+. plus. Community's got this as a 6+. Plus. Uh, and uh, for me, looking at this and listening to you talk about it, to me, what I'm seeing and feeling is this is the kid's gateway, ver gateway to Card Kingdoms of Valeria. Yeah, in a way. <laughs> it's, you know, and the one really nice thing about this, it, there is zero language dependency. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just dice and colors and pretty pictures. You don't need 
to worry about language. Uh, so you can start them early because you don't need to read. Colors and yeah. dots on the dice are all you need. Uh, and then once they read and can and, and can start battling monsters, get them into card kingdoms. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, the other, the other good thing about this too is like with a younger kid, you just have to do the math for the final scoring. Yeah. Because otherwise they're just matching, right? They're, they're probably not going to get the strategy of, at least I really like the kingdom thing. I got it. Like that was a big, that was almost a killer app part. The whole, I could see playing this with little G and her just giving the biggest card, but I could see playing with big G and her going, oh, I hope you take that one. So this guy shifts down so I can do this combo, right. which I like. Yeah. No, so I, I've talked a lot about board games. Uh, we are not just about board games. We are a tabletop gaming podcast. And tabletop to me means all forms of gaming socially with other people sitting around a table. And to be honest, also LARPs, but I have no experience there. So also gaming away from the table. Not my thing. But we have the first RPG of the night. Uh, and that is Iron Edda Accelerated. Now, we talked about this role-playing game during our interview with the designer, Tracy Barnett. That's uh, back on episode 34 of the podcast. Now, this was my second time playing the game, and I was honored again to be at a table run by Tracy themselves. Uh, this was another epic game, starting with Hold Fast Creation, ending with a massive battle between not one but two Dwarven Destroyers, along with their retinue of spiders and automatons, against the warriors of our Hold Fast and a bone-bonded giant. Uh, this time around, I played a Seer, which I'd never played before, uh, but the star of the show, holy cow, was our shield bearer, who managed to take two direct hits from a Dwarven Destroyer. Now, for those who don't know the game, think Norse warriors who summon the bones of dead giants to fight off dwarven kaiju during Ragnarok. If that doesn't sound epic and rocking to you, I don't know what's wrong with you. And if it does, I do strongly suggest checking out Iron Edda Accelerated. Uh, it uses the Fate Accelerated system. Very simple to learn. Um... From, I, I would say, a personal friend of mine, so there's a little caveat there, but I don't think the fact that I think Tracy is awesome makes his game any less awesome. No, Tracy is their fantastic, game. and their games are always epic. Uh, I played the Shield Bearer the one time I got to uh, sit down at the table with uh, them playing, uh, running the game for us, and I would happily sit down again. Uh, I was jealous looking at those table <laughs> selfies on that one. Uh, it's it's just a really great game. All right, up next for the nostalgia dig here, we've got Robotech Ace Pilot. Um, in Ace Pilot, you're rolling the dice, uh, similar to the 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 game we just talked about from Haba, which I'd need to find again. <laughs> so Robotech Ace Pilot, uh, it's another dice matching game. In this one, you're rolling the dice Yahtzee style uh, with the whole you get two re-rolls. You're going to try to get a combo to take a card. The cards are all characters from the hit TV series, right? The uh, ancient anime. Uh, each pilot card shows a unique attack pattern that you're going to compare to this tray that looks like a tic-tac-toe board, right? You've got a three by three grid with a bunch of Zentradi ships in it, all that have different attacks or different stats. And then every character has got a different attack pattern. So like Roy Falker might attack one, whereas Rick is awesome and can just attack any three spots. Whereas I am max, I think attack the four corners and so on. Uh, you're going to use your points to get cards. Then you're going to play your cards in order to do damage to the tiles in this little three by three grid. Every ship you blow up, you keep, and they're worth points. Uh, damage lingers. So if you hit like that big Zentradi battle cruiser for three and you're not able to finish it off with, say, the second pilot you drafted, you know you're probably just giving the kill to your opponent. Uh, very simple game. Uh, besides the license, like it's Robotech, and I grew up on Robotech, and I love Robotech, there was just something I really liked about this game. Now, this is a quick filler, and above, I know I talked about how I don't like games, but you know what? If I know it's a quick filler going in, I, there was just something about the combination, rolling dice, grabbing characters, pulling off that little combo where you happen to get Max attack the corner and Rick finishes them off with your second card. That was cool. I, I like this. I liked ending a game with a big stack of Zen Trotty tiles that I blew up by the end. Uh, very cool game. Uh, this has been put out by a couple different people. What's interesting is Japanime Games is now involved, whereas when I first saw this game, it was 100% independent. So it was cool to see that the game got picked up by a major publisher. 
Yeah, Strange Machine Games was the original uh, publishers of that one. So they don't have uh, too much out there except for some uh, Robotech uh, material. Yeah, there are two guys who went out and went after the Robotech license just to make Robotech games. What I wish I could talk about more is the Robotech Defense of the SDF-1 game they put out because that looks cool. But that was so sold out by the end of the weekend, there was no chance whatsoever. But I did get to try Robotech Ace Pilot, uh, a quick filler dice game in the Robotech universe. I thumbs up from the bellhop on that one. Yeah, the attack on the SDF one uh, looks a, a, a significantly more meaty game. Oh yeah, uh, it's it's a you know compared to a thirty minute game, it's a hundred and sixty minute game mm-hmm. uh, with uh, a weight of oh, it's only got a weight of two right now, but it's still pretty low early days for ratings. Uh, it definitely looks like a much more epic. Yeah. Uh, the The problem with that game is they were doing full games. They weren't doing demos. And while well, you said it, right, 160 minutes or whatever, it was uh, you needed to sign up and sit there forever. Right. It looks cool. I, to be honest, it looks interesting. It looks like it could just be a complete knockoff of Castle Panic, but I can't actually tell that until I get to try it. Right. But yeah, uh, Ace Pilot, it's fun. It, it's, it's not meaty. It, it's light but it's neat. All right. Here's one I didn't expect to be excited about in the least. Uh, Battlestar Galactica Starship Battles from Ares Games. This is them trying to compete with X-Wing because I think Ares Games is very jealous that X-Wing took off because they basically, X-Wing ripped off their Wings of War system. So I don't know if that's true. So that's just speculation. But this is um, a Starship Battle game. I I played X-Wing when it came out. I was big when X-Wing came out. I ran a demo the day that the Millennium Falcon and the um, Slave One came out at our local game store, Hugen and Munin. I gave away a bunch of free ships and tokens and like I was big into this game I loved X-Wing but I could not keep up Fantasy Flight just kept pounding out the ships and there was just too much to keep up with now I gave up on it and then even more so when they released the second edition and told me all my stuff I'd have to spend 50 bucks a faction to keep up with whatever done no way I'm buying X-Wing anymore so there is no way at all i was going to look at another version of the game which is the battlestar galactica version which is again program movement though i do like program movement i like the idea i just happened to be on my phone texting deanna to figure out where she was at when i was standing near the aries booth where they were doing a demo and i heard them talking about drift and i heard them talking about momentum and then i heard them talking about going through level changes and I got off the phone and I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. And I turned around and I sat down at this table. Now, this is a sci-fi miniature dogfight game that is actually trying to pull off that realistic space combat. Now, I say realistic, uh, people listening at home can't see my air quotes, but more realistic than the dogfighting in X-Wing, which makes sense because if you watch the Battlestar Galactica show, they did that whole thing where it was silent in space and the ships spun around interesting ways and only actually moved forward when their thrusters were on. Well, that's what this game is trying to do. Like this is a game where moving has nothing to do with the way your ship is pointing, except for that instant you hit your thrusters. Where uh, inertia and momentum and combining that with little bursts of thrusters is actually how you get your opponent into your firing arc. Like the game also accounts for three dimensional combat. Now it's abstract still, there's only four levels, but still, there's four levels. X Wing did not do that. Um, I, I'm surprised by even caring about this game, but man, was I impressed by what I saw of Battlestar Galactica Starship Battles from Ares Games. Like to say I was impressed, actually an understatement. I was kind of blown away by this game. Now, the nice thing I see about this is your starter pack gives you four ships Mm -hmm. right off the bat. Uh, And uh, at the moment, at least, there's only five other expansions. And being Battlestar Galactica, there's a limit to how much they're going to do. I mean, they don't have the sheer volume of canon that Star Wars does. So you're going to be, you're not there. It's going to be hard pressed for them to milk you for every dime the way Star Wars has wanted to over the years. Um, So I think this is probably something that that's well worth its uh, investment. It's rating an 8.3 already on BGG. Uh, with, uh, you know, 30 to 60 minute play time, 
Now it's two to ninety nine players. They're still saying uh, <laughs> best best at two, but uh... <clears throat> so I forget what I was going to say. Damn. Yeah, uh, Jamie in the chat. No, he still has unopened X Wing. Yeah, so do I, actually. Uh, no, the biggest thing. There you go. Sorry. Uh, the biggest thing they wanted to get across. Well, during this demo, is we are not X Wing. That that which makes sense, right? They they have to differentiate themselves. But you will never have an army. There is no army building. There will only ever be two factions, and the entire game is meant to be a dogfighting game. It's based off their Wings of Glory system, which is a uh, biplane fighting system so it's something aries knows well and does well you're never expected they said there's only planning one more wave ever yes there will be a raptor was what they kept telling everyone because that's a big ship from the show but you're not they're never going to put out a battlestar galactica they also said that they it is not in the plans and they never will be doing it they what they're going to release are new pilots which are just basically new cards for the ships you already have uh, while I was there, they did do a 36 player battle that finished in about two and a half hours. And from what I understand, it went flawlessly. I didn't get to see it, but that's why they say one to 99 players is there's no reason not to play more players. Uh, programming in this is card based. And you have a little plastic thing to set your things on. Uh, fairly simple system. But trying to figure out how to fly your ship definitely required mastery. Like figuring out how drift worked and everything else. But yeah, very impressed. Uh, Battlestar Galactica Starship Battles from Ares Games. Up next, I've got another role-playing game. One you will not be able to quite get your hands on yet, and that is Hydro Hacker Operatives from Phil Vecchion, otherwise known as H2O. Uh, this is a Powered by the Apocalypse role-playing game where you play hydropunk Robin Hoods, stealing water from the corporation in order to help out your neighborhood. Um, this is currently available as an ash can on drive through RPG, but the full game is coming to Kickstarter probably later this year or early next year now going in i'm already a fan of hydro hackers uh we had phil on the show you can watch our interview with phil where he talked all about his love of cyberpunk and where that evolved into hydro hackers uh personally i'm looking forward to this to come out in its full version hopefully that later this year now i took part in a brand new adventure in the game called blue europa uh, this was a heist game where we were stealing a block of pure blue ice that was just imported from space from the mines on Europa. I played a hacker in the adventure, and Phil made the mistake of mentioning the ice was being traveling by Zeppelin. And now, lesson to all your GMs, if you mention Zeppelin, your players are going to heist and steal that Zeppelin. Uh, despite the fact we totally went a different direction than Phil planned, we had a great session. Uh, I had a great time playing Hydro Hackers. I was pleased to hear at the end of it, we were able to provide some good feedback that is actually going to make it into the end game. So that was good. Uh, I had a great game playing with two of the misdirected Mark crew or the gem fans with a brand new person I'd never met before, which is always awesome to see a new person playing hydro hackers because it's not an easy sell when you don't know the game ahead of time no hydro hackers is uh, an interesting game but it's definitely something that sort of puts people off if you're not quite understanding it uh but knowing phil as as i do he really puts a lot of thought into mm -hmm. his games and his planning of sessions uh and the fact that he mentioned something that People decided to run with, and he was able to uh, roll with it and let you steal a Zeppelin that he probably yes. had no plans for you to grab whatsoever uh, is is very classic Phil. Yes. So. Yeah, Phil's take home from, from the game, We I went to two misdirected Mark panels. I, I'm not going to be covering panels in this overview of Origins, but I did go to a couple panels. In both panels, Phil's like, lesson to DMs, if you mention a Zeppelin, that Zeppelin is going to become a major part of your adventure. So I know we've already been going on for a while, but I only actually have one more game I played, despite being there for five days. This is the last one. This is the game I played the most at Origins already, and it's Go Cuckoo. Uh, this is a silly Haba game 
that is my most played game of Origins. At this point, I've already played six times. All of those times were played in Columbus. Uh, every one of those six plays were with grown adults. Uh, yet again, proving hobby games are not just for kids. Uh, this game was the hit of Origins for me. And no, it's not a new game. It, it was just recently reprinted. It was out of print for a bit. No one could get it. Uh, Wayne, the Star Wars guy, Humfleet, is the one that got my ear on this game. He was the bird in my ear. I was at the White Wizard booth where he was working. He's like, man, you got to check out this game with it's kind of like pickup sticks but backwards i'm like okay uh when i was meeting with haba i specifically asked them can i try this game and got to see a demo of it i then said hey let me take this home i will review this and i guarantee i'll give you a positive review because this is really cool and they were awesome enough to hand me a copy that night i broke it out at barley's which for people who don't know it is a restaurant right across the street from the hotel center fantastic beer selection we played a few rounds then the next day, I had it out on the table at base camp. That night, we went to a pub called the Three-Legged Mare, and we were playing there. I love this game. Um, I think of it as reverse Kerplunk, because you start off with a tin filled with color-coded sticks. Every round, you're going to pull out one to three of those sticks. You then place them horizontally over the tin, like between the other sticks, building a bird's nest. If the colors of both ends of the last stick you pull matches, you then also have to place an egg in that growing nest. If it falls through, you have to steal an egg from the player with the most. The goal is the first person to get rid of all their eggs. The first person to do that then has to put the large wooden cuckoo meeple onto the nest and manage. And if they manage to get to stay on the nest, they win. Uh, there's like just a little bit more to it, but that's basically the entire game. Everyone I showed this game loved it. Like th this was, everyone was going nuts for it. It's interesting. The, uh, the, the BGG uh, ratings are very split on this. Um, I'm not quite sure why. It's really, <laughs> it's really kind of odd. Maybe it's because it's a wait one game uh, and the lighter games on BGG tend not to do well. But yeah. uh, it's it's an interesting curve. I mean, it, it it sort of peaks out around around a seven. I think it's a six. Yeah, it's a six point eight rating. Yeah, it's not a great game, right? Yeah. Like, there's there's no way this would be a nine or a ten. Yep. Uh, and another thing, just I don't know how much you guys know how much Deanna hates dexterity games. She actually liked this one, so that's another sign. And she won a, a game of it. Yes. Yes. I have it on video. Even <laughs> I've got some great pictures. So that is Go Cuckoo from Haba Games. It's a 15 minute uh, and it's uh, ages four and up. So good for the kids and good for the drunk adults. <laughs> so now that's it for the games I got to actually play. Now, before I get into other games I saw and I'm excited about, how about we check in down at the lobby and see what's going on there? Well, we've had a lot of chatter going on. It's, it's great awesome. to see this much talk going on in the lobby this time. Uh, we've had a lot of people complaining about how old you made them feel talking about old Robotech. <laughs> uh, it is old. It we is. Old. It is. We don't want to, we don't want to actually admit that though. Uh, uh we, uh, we have stopped, uh, Wilt Chamberlain from, uh, asking to play Balthazar and ruin the game uh, of <laughs> BSG. Baltar. 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 Um, I don't know if there's a Baltar in the game, to be honest. Uh, the demo I did, we didn't use characters, so I don't even know what characters did to change the game. Yeah, I'm not even sure. I didn't see anything about characters in it. I'm They're not... definitely there. Like, okay. I saw the Apollo card. I got to hold the Apollo card, but I don't know what Apollo did by playing him. Modified the rules somehow. Right. That's something I didn't even mention. The combat system. I'd never seen this before. You had a bunch of damage chits in a bag, and you pulled one out. And that was how you damage the opponent's ships. And most of them just said like one, two, or three hull damage. But then there'd be ones of funky symbols, like you blew off a wing or your thrusters no longer work. Or there were ones that had a plus on them, so you'd pull it off and go do six damage, plus draw another one. So that was another unique thing. Instead of dice-based combat, it was pull chips from a bag. Uh, we're, we've also we've also named the new board game designer Roland Wright, the, uh, the most popular game. game designer of... <laughs> no, someone made that a game. Oh, really? a, there is a roll and write game called roll and write. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. Already. already. Yeah. Someone's already done it. I think uh, it's the same person that did deck building the deck building game. Right. Where you build wooden decks. Right. Yes. Of course. Uh, Will Chamberlain, glad to hear a Robotech game is good. Like I said it, it's quick though. Like it's a filler. You're, you're not getting much depth, but it's neat. There was another one, force of arms, Robotech force of arms. I didn't play this year at origins, but I played last year that I swear was like Rainier Nitzia makes a Robotech game, but it was all mass. You know, again, you had a grid of Zantradi 
it, but this one you were playing rows and columns. So you put your pilots in different rows and columns. And if you ever played the ancient Nizia game kingdoms, it was like that because you would do your math. And then if your math was big enough, when you matched up your rows and columns, you would destroy the Zentradi. It was neat. This, that though, again, it was like, it, it tried to push itself to medium weight, but wasn't heavy enough to be good, but wasn't quick enough to be light. So I didn't like that one as much. Whereas Ace Pilot was nice and quick enough that bang, 15 minutes, I blew up some Zentradi. Let's see who wins. And I liked it. All right. Uh, Will Chamberlain has confirmed that he, uh, uh, Catch the Moon is a book that he... Uh, it was a book. See, yeah, I thought it yeah. was a book. So, all right. All right. Again, thanks, everyone, for joining in and interacting. Absolutely. So now I'm going to talk about the awesome stuff I saw that I'm really excited about, but I didn't find time to play. Now, as a teaser, some of this stuff you're going to get to see reviewed in the coming months and weeks. And for those of you watching live, I can just kind of lean this way. And there's a bit more of a spoiler on what stuff you might get to see in the future. Up first is Alter Quest. Uh, this is a modern remake of the Milton Bradley Games Workshop Hero Quest. But this isn't like, like this is Hero Quest with the numbers filed off totally. Uh, they only had a prototype. They weren't doing demos. They did not have any copies to hand out. But I got to say it looked good. Like the miniatures in particular, like just drew me in because they were like 3D printed or possibly plastic, look 3D printed to me, versions of the cardboard Hero Quest scenery. Like they had the desk and it had the scales on it. And like the bookshelves had little rats crawling on the top. Uh, the game did not look like a direct ripoff of Hero Quest. So the theme, the look of the board, the campaign book, but then looked like a heavier game, more like a descent than say hero quest for complexity. Uh, this one I think is currently on Kickstarter. No, I don't have a copy to show off. I wish I did get to know more about this, but man, if you are a hero quest fan, keep a watch for this game, alter quest. And that's uh, scheduled for 2020 release on uh, BGG right now. Uh, up next possibly the hottest game of origins besides sorcerer or as hot was dead man's cabal from pandasaurus uh this seemed to be the game of the show this is what most people were talking about they spent a ton on advertising you couldn't go anywhere in the halls without seeing pictures of this game um every person who talked to me who knew me and were also social media content creators were like did you get to check out dead man's cabal unfortunately i didn't but i can't wait to try it out uh, this one's big enough that uh, if you go to the BGG page for it, the first thing there is actually the BGG overview video that I assume they did at uh, at Origins. Like they have their own video content at the top of the Board Game Geek page. So I I don't think I've ever actually seen that on yeah. a Board Game it, Geek page. It, it was big. It it was really big, and uh, I had to pull in some some favors. We'll say for that one. Uh, up next, I don't know if you guys read it or cared. I know some of you in the chat did, but I did a review of the Shadowrun 5th Edition starter set. A not very positive review of the Shadowrun 5th Edition starter set because I was an elitist. I can't say that because we're not explicit. I was an elitist <laughs> gamer when I was a kid and refused to play this silly game that was putting elves in my cyberpunk. I've matured since then. And I know a lot of people who have a deep love for the Shadowrun setting. And as a more mature gamer, I'm still really curious to see what the, the fuss is about, why everyone loves this game so much. That fifth edition box set was not a good intro to the game. It did not work for me. So this year, they released a sixth edition of Shadowrun. They are really shouting as loud as they can that they finally made a more accessible system that's more easy to learn and doesn't require 87 D6s for one attack. Uh, it's supposed to be the new thing. They finally made it accessible. Well, we're going to find out because they released the Shadowrun sixth world beginner box set, and I was able to pick up a copy. I going to be very curious to find out if they've done a better job on this box than the last one. They'd swear they have, but we'll see. Yeah, I, I don't really have much to say about this. I've never been an elves with hacking <laughs> fan. So, you know, I guess I'm... Uh, Sean's not woke to Shadowrun. No, nope, apparently not. Uh, I like my hacking with uh, <laughs> with, I don't know, humans, I guess. I, I'm sure I'm biased. I'll, I'll admit it. I'll take that. <laughs> hey, not every game for everyone else. <laughs> yep. 
Yeah, as 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 Will Chamberlain says, yes, another year of Shadowrun. They have advanced it to the sixth world. Yep. We we will see. Uh, up next, one that man, if I had the money, I need this. They put out a loop de loop for pitch car. Uh, they had it there. I actually I could almost put this under played because I flicked a couple things around. And I'm surprised because it wasn't as hard as I thought it would be. It worked really well. You had to get enough oomph, but I like only twice did my thing fly out. Never did it fly across the room. Uh, I thought it was going to be way too hard to make the loop. You just got to give it a pretty good flick and man does it look so cool like this is a game i am going to bring this out and people are going to be like what are you playing like the, this is a draw people in like pitch car is already amazing uh what i didn't see is the price because god pitch car is expensive uh in the first place so i don't know how much this loop is uh and deanna points out in the chat yeah she kind of weaponized her flick because deanna's not very good at dexterity games i don't think that was a fault of the loop yeah, it's interesting. Uh, now, was the were the cards, uh, the base cards for it, good and flat and solid? Because I'm looking at a picture from their their spiel uh, uh, spiel de jar mock up, and it looked like they were having at that time still some problems getting it sort of flat uh, where no, it meets the original tracks. It was great what we saw. Okay, great. There was no problem whatsoever. Yeah, like perfectly smooth. Like I'm thinking about it. I've, there's a picture on the blog post. So if you do check out the blog post where I basically recap all this, there's a good picture of the loop on there. Oh, and you know what? I'm looking at the Kickstarter now, and it, it is good. This is just the board game geek picture that's, uh, that's just not a great negative. picture. Yeah, it's just a... it looks like you can do it like differently. It looks like it might be flexible. Like you can do different. Like the loop they had was big. Like it looped around. It was cool. So that's a uh, pitch car expansion seven. It's listed as, but the loop, I, uh, I got to get a copy at some and, point point. Uh, and on Kickstarter. It was $52. Well, that's not bad for pitch car to be honest, so, you know, uh, tasty minstrel games had a very, very shiny copy of the deluxified edition of crusaders. Thy will be done. Um, I would have brought a copy home of this, but they sold out of the retail copy they pre-orders are closed on the retail copy and they only had so many deluxified editions and all of those were gone by Saturday. So the only thing they had were their demo copies and even those were spoken for. So this looks cool. Uh, this is the latest deluxified game from T Tasty Minstrel. Um, gameplay looks really solid. Um, you're playing Crusaders out crusading area control. Um, randomized movement and it is the second game ever as far as i know to use the mancala mechanism but unlike trajan the action you do is where you take your things from so it's not quite as ap prone there's not quite as much math required to figure out to stop in the right spot uh looks good uh did not even manage to get a demo in because this was another one that was booked all weekend there was no way you could get to play this without booking ahead of time and it wasn't something i booked to do um really hoping this is something tasty mentioned might be worrying, willing to work with going forward, but right now it looks good. And uh, apparently, BGG must have made some upgrades to the way they do things because they've got an instructional video for this one up on top of their page. So they are obviously now that they're gaining more content and doing more video content at these uh, at these cons, they're they're obviously looking to uh, you know monetize it and uh, push yep. push their content first. And you know can't can't mm -hmm. blame them for that. Uh, this is a 7.7 7 on... Uh, That's pretty good. On there. And I have to say, the metal money... Uh, sorry, oh, it's yeah. Not, it's not money, it's influence tokens. Yes. It's, it is gorgeous. Everything about this. Uh, just like Gent this Deluxified, right? Everyone saw my copy of that. Um, another one... Deanna just mentioned too, your Moncala could upgrade. So your choice was either do the action or upgrade it. So next time it's better. Look good. I didn't really get, I got like a five minute overview from Lance Mixter, the Unstead Viking kind of talked about the game a bit. I really couldn't tell you more. So that's Crusaders. Thy will be done from tasty minstrel games. Now up next is one that I am going to get Sean down here to play at some point, And this is the eight bit box from yellow. Uh, this is, I don't, I don't even know how to describe it. It's like a, it's a game system toolkit. Uh, it is a system for recreating retro style arcade games in board game form. You buy the base box that kind of looks like a Nintendo and it comes with all the tools to play a bunch of different games. So there's uh, controllers, there's some dice, there's cubes, there's like all, it's it's almost like the old um, 
cheap ass games, except it's giving you all the components at once. And in the box are three, they call them cartridges, three cartridges, letting you play three different games. And there's like, um, one that looks like it's river Raiders. There's a Pac-Man and off the top of my head, I'm totally forgetting what the third game that comes in the base set is. But what I was excited by is their newest cartridge, which is a knockoff of double dragon. And while Sean and I growing up used to go to a coffee shop that I can't remember the name is, pay 10 cents for yesterday's donuts, drop one quarter into this game. And if you banged on it the right way, it would give you extra credits and play Double Dragon until we won at least once, if not multiple times. One of the first things I asked Yellow was, is there an elbow move in the game? And unfortunately, they weren't sure. Um, the whole concept of this fascinates me. I think it's really cool. Um, the controllers actually have like up, down, left, right type of stuff. And you could, it, it uses pre-programmed movement for some of the things. So you program if your guy's going to move up and left. I, the thing just looks cool. And I got to admit, nostalgia fan here, I love the subject matter. This looks like a really cool system. And I'm really looking forward to checking it out. And so that's the 8-bit box Double Rumble. Is, yeah, is the actual, the, the Double Dragon ripoff. Uh, I will admit that's not out yet. So I can't tell you much about that except for what I got to see at the con. You've probably seen pictures on my social media feed. But the 8-bit box itself just looks cool. It looks awesome. Yeah, and that one, and uh, there's there's not even, they, they don't even really have anything for that on BGG. There's somebody, somebody got an instructional video in German, but <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's it. it. Wow. Yeah. So no votes, no nothing. It's uh, t TBD. All right. This next one's for Neil Helmer, a friend of mine who likes heavy games. The heaviest, most popular game at Origins was Pipeline. Uh, the latest from Clay from Capstone Games. Everyone who is into heavy games was going nuts for this game. Uh, this sold out. No chance to play it. Demo games were long. Uh, just didn't fit it in know almost nothing about the game i really can't talk to pipeline but like if you're the heavy gamer that was the game of the show this is the one you want to dig into a little deeper i know it's got some waterworks aspects of it with tiles building pipes and i know it's an economic game and i'm guessing it's probably just a retheme of a train game because instead of trains you have pipes but i like it because man there's a lot of train games out there so it's still early in its uh life cycle obviously but it's rating a 7 8 with a weight of 3.8 yeah. Uh, and uh, it is uh, basically uh, unable to keep up with demand. The government has only one option, but you privatize the oil industry. And this <laughs> is where you come in. So there you you're, looking, it, you're looking you're looking to capitalize on the fact that the oil uh, the oil industry is being privatized, and you are starting a company in the oil business to build the most efficient pipeline network. So yes, there's definitely some. Some, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's a road building game. It's, yeah. it's a it's a trade game. Tile placement, road building, network building. So that's Pipeline by Capstone Games. Uh, up next, a uh, game that you couldn't actually play, but they had uh, prototypes out, and that is Teotihuacan, the late pre-classic period. Uh, this is obviously an expansion for Teotihuacan. Uh, it's going to actually come out at Gen Con. They were hoping to have it out at Origins, didn't make it on time. They did have the prototype out, but you weren't even allowed to touch it. Really, uh, it looks solid from what I could see. It's reminded me a lot of the Zolkin expansion. Excuse me. Reminded me a lot of the Zolkin expansion, which makes sense because it's the same designer. And it was a bunch of modular stuff you could add in. Uh, you can mix it and match what you want to add in. Uh, there were new building tiles, so new spots to replace the spots on the boards. Uh, they had the tribe thing, which to me is right out of Zulkin, where everyone picks a tribe at the start of the game that adds asymmetry. Uh, there was a ninth temple or something you built in addition to the temple in the middle. Uh, it looked cool. It, it looked good. Unfortunately, like they weren't even doing demos. It was, hey, look at the box, look at the components. Wow. Uh, that's Teotihuacan late pre-classic period. And as, as we pointed out many, many times, anything that adds in asymmetrical play to the games <laughs> tends to uh, enhance your enjoyment of it. So it'll be interesting to see uh, how much uh, they've done there. Uh, and it looks like uh, all modules are compatible with one another and can be enjoyed together or individually. Yeah. So it's much like what's happened with some, you know, the dinosaur game, you know, you've got mm -hmm. a bunch of bits that you can throw in parts. And if you don't like some of them, you can leave them out and you're still good to go. All right, up next is Planet. Uh, I'm not going to go on a lot on this one just because I talked about this at Breakout Con. They had a demo copy at Breakout before the game was even released. You can listen to that episode. But I will say this game is so popular, they sold out. 
air freighted in more, sold out of those, air freighted in more and sold out of those. You could not get a copy of Planet by the end of the weekend. I still think this, if you like quick filler, but thinky, uh, to use the heavy cardboard term, the thinky filler style game, you're going to dig Planet. I loved it. Still can't get a copy, though. Up next is a big one for the Grognards out there. The old Avalon Hill Doom game, which has been reprinted as Rex from Fantasy Flight Game, but no one cared because it wasn't Dune anymore, is finally coming back as Dune yet again. I don't know how they managed to do it, but Gale Force 9 somehow managed to work with the Hebert family, Herbert Hebert, not sure how it's pronounced, to get the actual license to Dune. It is going to be released at the same time as the new Dune movie that is coming, so expect next year to possibly be the year of Dune. Uh, this is the same designers that did Rex. And from what I understand, they've also kept the rule improvements that were added. Now, like all those other people, I didn't care for Rex because I don't care about Rex. I want to play some flipping Fremen, not whatever space race they name them. So I couldn't tell you exactly what those improvements are. But man, this was hot. Uh, some people, I will say, were going nuts for this because there's enough people who didn't. They were so young they don't remember Dune or never got into the hype. But this, the, the, there was a lot of buzz around the giant Dune table. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, it's not actually listed on Board Game Geek, so I I can't add much more to it. Well, it is, but it's listed under the 1970s version because it is the same game. Interesting. They just added Gale Force Nine as the new publisher. Interesting. So there's no... Oh, it, there it we is. are. GF9 edition. Yeah. There we are. Yeah, it's listed as a different... Because they didn't change enough for it to be a separate entry, which for fans of the old game is awesome, right? You're getting that game that sells for hundreds, if not thousands of dollars for the last few years, finally back on the market. So release date is August 24th, 2019. Oh, this year. I'm surprised by that. It didn't seem quite ready yet, but that's, who knows? That's what they're showing on the page anyway. Uh, up next, Legacy of Lopan. Uh, I don't know how many other people are excited about this, but I am. Uh, this is an expansion for Big Trouble in Little China. That was the game we played during the Tabletop Bellhop launch party and live streamed. One of the first games we ever totally streamed. Uh, it's adding a totally new scenario that expands on the events of the movie and the core game and was given blessing by whoever the powers may be that own the licensing that said, we dig what you did with this. Uh, looking forward to checking that out. Uh, big fans, not the right word. Interesting game. I really dig and I love the license. So it's going to be cool. Supposedly this improves the game. Uh, so it adds two extra players. Uh, it's now a six player game uh, once you once you add in this expansion. So that's the one big thing they've got going for it. But again, a lot of uh, details don't seem to be out there. So we'll have to uh, wait and see. Which is weird because that was available for purchase. So it's possible it came out right at Origins. Interesting. Like this wasn't a pre-production. I was able to get a copy. It's it's rated high, but not enough ratings to actually count for yeah. anything. Well, the people who liked it like it, and right. we'll see how it does. So that's Legacy of Lopan for Big Trouble in Little China. I apologize. I don't remember who puts that game out. Uh, Everything Epic Games is the publisher. There you go. Thank you. Uh, up next, Endeavor Age of Expansion. Uh, this is obviously an expansion for the game Endeavor. Uh, what I thought was cool here is... All it does is gives you a completely new set of buildings and a completely new set of cards. No new rules. You just swap out your buildings and swap out your cards. Um, according to the designer, this promises to be a completely different strategic experience without having to learn anything new, which I thought was kind of a cool way to do an expansion. Yeah, the, uh, the description is literally players will take the mechanisms they know and love and use them with a new set of buildings and cards for all new gameplay and interaction. Yeah, sounds solid. Yeah. They, they premiered there, but they didn't have it for sale. I think it's actually on Kickstarter right now if people are interested. Uh, there is a pre-order. Yes, pre-order on Kickstarter. Yeah, right now. And that was Endeavor Age of Expansion. Uh, Pre-orders start at $35 or more. Canadian. Which, uh, that sounds expensive for just new cards and new things, but hey. Up next, uh, we are getting near the end if you're getting tired. 
A lot of cool stuff at Origins. Is a game called Sanctum. Uh, this is the latest game coming from Czech Games Edition or CGE. Their selling point is you walk up, they go, hey, did you play Diablo? And most people there are probably going to say yes, whether one or the other edition. And they say this is Diablo the board game. Uh, this one was just a prototype in a glass case. So I didn't get to see much more than that. They did point out that it was a dice-based combat system. Everyone played individual characters that were asymmetric. And of course, because it's Diablo, they drop loot. So there are multiple copies of all the bad guys. You shuffle them, and when you kill them, you flip them over to see what loot you get. And of course, your loot makes your character better to kill more monsters, to get more loot. So I got to say, it kind of sounds like Diablo. Yeah, no, looking at the prototype images on BGG, it is very Diablo-like. Uh, it is uh, a dice-matching game, so there's a little bit of that car uh, Valeria, um, you know, find your dice and uh, and hit on there to kill the demons, it looks like. So you're you're looking to, to roll and, and match uh, to go out slaying, uh, and it's got the four character classes from mm -hmm. Diablo, the original Diablo, so we're not even going into the new school. That'll be um, the expansion next exactly, year. Exactly, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, they're, they're definitely sort of jumping on that old school Diablo bandwagon and, uh, seeing what they can do with it and, uh, good luck to them. Yeah. They say it looks solid. I wish I could have got to try that one. And that was Sanctum from CGE, the Diablo board game. So here's another one where I really did not expect to be talking about it. And it is the Warhammer 40,000 Wrath and Glory starter set. So Wrath and Glory is the latest Warhammer 40K role-playing game. No longer does Fantasy Flight have that license. So this isn't the, um, I can't even remember, Rogue Trader. And I don't even remember all the fancy. They had like five different 40K role-playing games. This is a new company doing it. Um, I went to the booth. Because I wanted to see the Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 4th Edition starter set. Which, I gotta admit, looks pretty good. Uh, but while I was over there, I got distracted by the 40k one. Now, I'm still way more of a fantasy fan, but this is one of the most beautiful RPG starter boxes I have ever seen. Uh, individual character dossiers. Um, impressive things like the fact that over half the characters were female, which is rare in a Warhammer 40k setting. Really cool to see that. The Commissar is female. Good work there. I like that. Amazing looking maps. But the one that really drew me in were acrylic character tokens for all of the NPCs, monsters, and characters. Like that looked really fancy. Uh, dice, everything. Like amazing looking box set. Uh, the Fantasy Roleplay 4th Edition, we took a look through the rule book, the hardcover. It looks just as good. But man... Did this box set, was it ever shiny? I got to meet the editor on Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 2nd and 4th edition, so that was kind of cool. Of course, it was after I said that 2nd edition was the worst edition of Warhammer ever to come out. So now and then, you got to remember, when at my press, I have to remember not to say bad things. So that's one of my lessons learned of Origins. Uh, and Dee points out that not only were there females in the game, but they had clothes on. yes. So. And in Warhammer, that means lots of shoulder pads and armor, mostly. But, well, I mean, yes. I have I have a hard time imagining anything in 40k doing, you know, the Frazetta thing. That just seems yeah, it's you're, you're going not. to die in in seconds. I don't really, you know, before before you finish getting your little bikini on, you're going to be dead. So, you know, just throw <laughs> yes. some armor on there and get out there with a uh, chainsaw. Uh, yeah, so that, that was the 40k Wrath and Glory starter set. Uh, if you're a fan of 40k at all, this looks worth checking out. Uh, here I'm going to combine two games at once because both of these games are from Daily Magic Games. Uh, it's Chocolatiers and Horizons. Now for Chocolatiers, the, the, the designer, uh, Isaiah Vallejo, was there. Uh, Sean loves Isaiah Vallejo even though he doesn't know it because he is the person who wrote all of the Valeria games, including Valeria Card Kingdoms. Uh, his new game, oddly enough, is a quick filler game about filling a box of chocolates. So cool enough. Uh, they had demo games going of that. They also had demo games of Horizon going, but I just never found time. I was too busy at other booths. Uh, I love Daily Magic Games. I, we found them at Origins 2014, played Valeria Card Kingdoms, and it was the first game I ever bought at Con. Uh, it was the first game we walked out of 10 times before we went home. Big fan of that company. Don't know a lot about these games, but I thought it would be cool to check them out, uh, being a fan of the designer and the company behind them. Absolutely. And, uh, 
It's uh, it's already ranking about a seven on uh, Board Game Geek. We, again, early days. Who knows where that's going to go in the long term? But uh, getting a good solid with a weight of one uh, one and a third. That's Chocolatiers. Chocolatiers, yeah. See, I don't think Horizons is doing very well for them. That one I keep seeing for sale everywhere, uh, doing the whole tabletop deals thing. It's a, some kind of card driven game. Again, it looks cool. I don't know a lot of these. I am buying. I, I'm looking at these games, or I'm taking a look at these games based on my love for the company and the designers. Uh, I, they have yet to disappoint me, and I'm hoping I won't be proved wrong with Chocolatiers or Horizons. Uh, Horizons is actually ranking higher at this point. Oh, there we go. Uh, and they have a BGG overview video, so uh, maybe maybe they'll get some help out of that. So uh, uh, we talked about this for a long time. We've been on the air for a long time. There is a lot of other stuff that I saw, like like way more that like we could be here for another two hours. Um, there's a new Cathala game out, Ishtar from Yellow, which no, it's not based on the bad movie. They, everyone seemed pretty nuts of that. Uh, Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea. Oh my God. Seeing that on a table with the two layer. Wow, that looked good. Um, too Many Bones. I don't know. I don't hear much hype around here or people talking about this, but they have the most impressive booth at Origins now two years in a row. And it's a poker chip base. They call it a role playing game, though. Every time, every year I have to correct them because there's no role playing elements, but you're playing fantasy characters and you're battling monsters. Uh, but it's not a role playing game because you don't carry over anything to your next match. Like there, there's no actual campaign play. But man, that looks awesome. And some of the best components I've ever seen. Every player gets 36 unique dice for all your different attacks you put them into a neoprene player mat with cubes cut it oh it's so nice uh a new edition of BattleTech came out this year that except for a nice selfie i took with a giant mac i didn't really get to check out uh yellow has a warhammer 40k board game so i guess games workshops working with more people um the miniature game tables oh my god you got to see some of the pictures i shared like there was just stuff everywhere it was around every corner uh we mentioned this in the pre-show but one of the things that was definitely different in origins this year is there are halls a b and c and these are massive halls like if you haven't been there I, I don't even know how big they are they're huge and hall a and c are normally gaming halls so that's where you go to play demo games tournaments that's where the open board gaming area is it's where the tournaments are. It's where you go to play hero clicks and all that. And then hall B in the middle, the actual exhibit hall where it's all they're selling stuff. Well, this year that middle hall spread out into the other halls. So it was really interesting. Cause like queen games, I talked about, I went to their, their opening party was in the board game hall. They didn't even have a booth in the exhibit hall. And there were multiple companies doing that. Whiz kids only had, uh, they were in the board game hall or the gaming halls. So the exhibit hall is spread into the other gaming halls. So there's a lot more to see. There used to always be something called the artist alley where they had artists and they had writers. They pulled them out of the halls and put them in all right pulled them out of the exhibit halls and put them in the hallway sounds weird but there's like these i don't know they call them pods pod a b c so that's where they were so they weren't even in the exhibit halls they were outside um they also added um for people who are into pop culture there were fans i could have met cordelia from buffy uh charisma carpenter was there and i could have got a signature not my thing not my scene there were other stars there that was one that stuck out in my head there was someone else from buffy um willow's girlfriend it's been a while since I've seen Allison Buffy. Hannigan. Yeah, she was there. So there were a whole bunch of there was yeah, the end point, Doctor Who folk. Uh, they had that going on. There was more cosplay than I'd seen before. Thursday this year, the exhibit hall was as busy as Friday last year. Now Saturday didn't seem to have exploded. Like unlike um, Gen Con, you still can walk around. You can still get game demo games in. You're not weaseling between people, despite the fact that this giant backpack you could buy to hold board games was only twenty dollars and everyone flipping had them you still could dodge those people pretty easily like it was just insane the amount of stuff like like i covered what i don't even know if it's like 20 percent of the con with what i'm mentioning here and probably not even that so so just to clarify the uh exhibit hall space only so just the exhibit halls so that's is b uh well a b and a b c and d so the halls okay. The, the full halls mm -hmm. are 370,000 square feet. Yeah, it's big. You, and you, that's it, just the halls. <laughs> you cannot do it. Like, okay. you can't see it all. It's not possible. So to wrap things up, I want to state, for me, though, 
all I've talked about here really is games. That's not all that Origins is about. Because some of my favorite parts of the Origins game fair had nothing to do with the games I saw or the games I played. The best part of Origins for me is what happens away from the game table. Well, or at the game table with my friends, away from the dealer halls, away from the exhibit halls. It's the awesome people I've met over the years. And man, does Columbus have some amazing food and drink. And I got to say, 2019 was the best year yet for this. I met so many people. And no, I'm not going to name drop anyone because I'll forget someone and I'll feel bad about that. There were just tons of you. You know who you are. I had so many fantastic social interactions, conversations, off the books, games, food and drink shared, just sitting around talking to people, hanging out at base camp. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's fantastic. And and I, I felt I I, I was definitely missing it. Uh, you know, I had, I actually had a great father's day weekend with my kids, but, uh, I, I may have to change, reschedule that father's day weekend for a different weekend next year. Yeah, that's what we're doing here, right? Uh, it's also my mom's birthday, so happy birthday, mom. I do apologize for not being home, but I don't think I'm going to be home next year either. Uh, <laughs> we'll be hitting the carousels this weekend to make it up for it. So uh, just to highlight some of the non-gaming things, this is kind of like a big mash list of, of stuff that was awesome at Origins 2019. Uh, Gem Base Camp, that's the misdirected Mark crew. They There's a spot they grab. Uh being able to stop by after you finish gaming, you want to sit down, you want to decompress. There's a spot to meet up with friends, something they're now doing, excuse me, at every con that they do just as well, excuse me, just as well as origins. Uh, lunch at bear burger where I had a fantastic create your own burger, some great beers, uh, something called origins after hours at the basement of Barley's. That was really cool. And that's where we played an awful lot of go cuckoo. Uh, the misdirected Mark get together at the Eagle. Wow. Um, you want to talk good fried chicken? Like this is just south of Frankenmuth. Like Frankenmuth, you can't beat. Sorry, Phil. It was good chicken. It wasn't Frankenmuth level, but just south of Frankenmuth. Uh, the Pride Parade on Saturday. For people who may not know, Pride is the same weekend as Origins, which is one of the reasons hotels are so damn expensive. But just being able to sit and watch the parade, uh, just a tip. If you go to the walkway between the Hilton and the convention center, you get to stand right over top of the parade, which is really cool. Um, though it sucked at the time, I got to admit, I have fond memories of getting lost. Lost on the way home from the three-legged mare. Um, we finally tried Jenny's ice cream, and man, everyone's right. Um, not sure why it took us five years to, to finally try it. And then we also made it to melt. Oh my god. This is like like there's a place in Windsor that has 31 flavors of, of grilled cheese. No, that's not melt. Melt is oh wow. So melt is now on the checklist. You have to go every year. We'll be doing that next year for sure. Uh Belgian Waffle Co. for dinner. And you'll gotta get a four pack to go because that's breakfast the next day. Uh playing retro video games at Brucadia and oh my god, I am terrible at Tron now. Like I don't even think I've lasted a minute total over the whole credit trying the four different games. I remember being good at that game at one point. And like all of this, like none of that's gaming, right? And all of this is just as awesome as being able to go to that launch party for Queen and sit down and get to learn Merlin and Copenhagen with a private tutor. That was pretty awesome. Absolutely. So look forward to next year when hopefully the entire team will be there for at least part of the convention. Uh, I may not be there for the whole time, but uh, we'll definitely be looking to see if we can have more of a uh, established presence on the floor and around at the various uh, locations so that we can cover even more for our listeners. Yeah, because I guess I truly love going to Columbus for this convention. Like, it's so awesome to have such great stuff within walking distance of the convention center. Uh, it's way better than any other con I've attended for that. Well, I do love the games and I love the people and now I got to go to work, but the best part is still the people I get to enjoy it with. And it would be awesome if more of you could make it next year. So now that we've heard about origins 2019 and Mo has convinced us all that we absolutely <laughs> have to join him next there next year, let's stop in Check in with our chat room one more time. Uh, so uh, Deanna points out that Mercedes Lackey was there yep. as an author guest of honor. Uh, Shadzar was saying there well, one hall was just an artist's alley uh, mm. with some people streaming from there for better or worse. Huh. Uh, and uh, yeah, so let's see what else we got here. Um, I think we covered a lot of this stuff going uh, going through as we we covered. 
But so uh, one, one thing Shadzar mentioned that's worth checking out is if you can't make it, Board Game Geek has been streaming the show live every year, and that's how he was able to check out the show. Yep. So as well as artists, uh, various artists streaming their own art, yes, there are uh, sort of official, pseudo-official streams from people like Board Game Geek. Uh, and a lot of the other, a lot of the other channels, I think, had uh, live from sort of things happening as well. Uh, Shad's are asking, what's the biggest game I heard about, wanted to try, but missed and wanted to buy, but ran out of. So the one I wanted to try the most was, was Dead Man's Cabal. That was the one I never got to try, but I will get to try that eventually. So I, that was one that I actually passed on demos because I was hoping to bring a copy home. As for wanted to buy, but ran out of, I mentioned it right at the top. First game I mentioned Merlin. I really liked that. That was a solid Steppenfeld game. I love Rondell's. Rondell and Feld together just sounds amazing to me. And well, I got to play a full game and I really liked it, but that was totally gone. I would have loved to have also tried Pipeline. I just, there wasn't the time, right? Like having to sit down for, two to three hours to play one game where in the same amount of time I could have demoed five makes it a little, it, it's a hard decision to make. Like even with playing the role-playing games, right? The one day I played Hydro Hackers and I also played Iron Ed in the same day, that was eight hours of my day tied up playing role-playing games. And I got to admit, I felt a little guilty. So it's worth mentioning now, one of the big things for next year is scheduling for us. Cause as I think I work too hard for a con. Uh, I was told by many people who have badges that say this fancy word on the bottom that I was doing way more work than is required to earn this, which is cool. I don't mind that, but a lot of the work was also, okay, Deanna's telling me this is after show content. All right, we can save this for the after show. All right, so that's it for our Origins wrap up. If you'd like to read more about other gaming and game night topics like this, be sure to check out our blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice, where you'll see plenty of topics answered in blog form. So if you got a question for us, head over to the website and click on Ask the Bellhop or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Now we, we keep growing with the support of fans like you. So if you haven't yet, please take a minute to subscribe, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, or share with your friends. Wherever and however you find us, you can help us grow. Uh, sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I'll be sending out an email recapping all the content we've released in the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, and anything else we create. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com website where you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. So now that Origins is done, the next big con, I should say the next con, it's not that big yet, but it's growing, is Queen City Conquest. Queen City Conquest is hitting much earlier this year. This year, it will be July 12th to the 15th. It will be held in a new venue, Damon College. Now, Deanna and I will be there attending a special guest. Uh, this will be your chance to play games with the Bellhop team. Both Deanna and I have signed up to run some board games, a mix of the new hotness and some of our personal favorites. You can find out more about QCC, pre-order your badge, and sign up to play games with the Bellhop team at queencityconquest.com. Now, a quick shout out and thank you to some of our Patreon backers. Their support helps make this show possible. Roger Linscott Jr., thank you. Brian Kurtz, thanks. Yuho Rutila, thank you. Duran Barnett, thanks. Last but not least, a big welcome to our latest patron, John Carney, also known as Evil John, who I have to thank for a fantastic Wednesday evening nightcap at Origins. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift is coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can also find us on Board Game Geek as guild number 3347. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletopping OHOP gaming podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. You can also watch us game live here on Twitch Friday nights at 8.30, mostly Gloomhaven, but now and then we'll surprise you with something else. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. Hang around and join us in the penthouse suite for the Off the Books After Show. 
For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on.